I hate to burst your bubble because you may have been thinking that in these Elysian fields of a sunny bank holiday Monday in our green and pleasant land that all was right with the world, but actually we are stricken with multiple crises that we're going to explore today. Let me start with the obvious. There's a crisis in the summer festival circuit following the tragic death of a young girl yesterday who took not one but two pills, presumably of dubious provenance and presumably of dubious quality. And her mother has sent a heart-rending appeal to the parents and the children that will be headed for Britain's summer festivals this year. As the father of five children myself, I got to thinking this morning. You know, her parents must never have imagined that she would be taking drugs at the festival, the mutiny festival that she attended. It probably never crossed their mind. That's the sort of thing that other people's children do. And therefore, this could have happened, if not to any of us, because we don't all have children, about which more later, but to many of us. It could have happened to many of our children. Two dead in one weekend. The Portsmouth Mutiny Festival. Well, Dr. Henry Fisher, policy director of Vault Fast, a think tank that explores public policy relating to drugs, has some very challenging, for me, radical ideas as to how that crisis can be tackled. Then there's a crisis in Italy. You may think that Italy is a far-off country of which you know little, at least of their politics. You may think this doesn't affect you. But as a matter of fact, the Italian political crisis is and has as its centre the overweening, dominating, bullying, aggressive power of the EU, the European Union, with which we ourselves are now grappling in our attempts to leave it following the decision to do so by 17.4 million British people just a couple of years ago. The president of Italy has scuppered the formation of a radical government of the League, the Italian League, and the Five Star Movement, who together polled well over half of the votes in Italy. The president has scuppered the formation of a government because the putative governing coalition had nominated as its finance minister someone who is sceptical about the value to Italy of the euro, who believes that the euro serves the interests of the German economy, but not the other economies, and certainly not Italy's economy. Now, that may or may not be true. I happen to think it's true in spades. But it's a matter, surely, for the electorate who governs them, not the deep EU state which has undoubtedly prevailed upon the Italian president not to allow the governing coalition to have this person as their finance minister. So, the putative governing coalition has walked away, handed the mandate back to the president and said, well, if we can't have the finance minister we have chosen rather than one that you and the EU want to choose, well, we'll have to have new elections. And if there are new elections in Italy, you can be sure that the League and the Five Star Movement will experience a significant political swing in their favour and will be re-elected by a larger majority. And that will be a crisis indeed for the EU. 
There's a crisis in Britain, even on this sunny morning, and you may not want to talk about it. But we are now governed by ten bigots from the six counties of the north of Ireland. The DUP now controls the course of events for the entire United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. This was an ineluctable consequence of the disastrous decision made by Theresa May, about whom more later, to call a wholly unnecessary general election last year and then lose it, placing her party, the Conservative Party, entirely dependent upon the DUP of Ian Paisley et al. Why has this now become so sharply a focus of political attention as opposed to last week? Well, the Irish Republic voted in a referendum at the weekend by a landslide majority to radically change Ireland's very restrictive laws on abortion, leaving just six counties of Ireland in the entire two countries of the UK and Ireland, which continue to make abortion illegal, forcing women who want an abortion to leave their own country and go to somebody else's country in order to have the procedure carried out. And the early signs are that the DUP are digging in. So we have a British government that will have to tolerate the existence of a different abortion law in just six counties of a country which as a whole has liberalized policy towards abortion in both the island of Ireland and in the United Kingdom. That's not a tenable situation. The campaign which won such a huge majority in the Republic in the referendum at the weekend is not going to stop at the non-existent border of the six counties. A massive campaign will now take place to make what they call Northern Ireland's abortion law the same as the abortion law in Ireland or in Britain or in both. Now, let me put my cards on the table. I'm against abortion. I'm not trying to force anyone else or legislate for anyone else to accept my point of view, but I'm against it for religious and moral reasons. But you simply can't have one abortion law in a tiny part of the United Kingdom, a tiny part of Ireland. You can't expect that to be a stable political settlement. You can't, and it won't be. And so the skids are under the DUP, not just on abortion, but on Brexit and on them keeping Theresa May in power. And there's a crisis in British governance itself. How quietly, apparently imperceptibly, we have moved into a post Theresa May era. Nobody, nobody in the Tory party, in the media, in the general public, any longer believes that this disastrous, this walking disaster of Theresa May is going to be in power much longer. Attention has swiftly moved now as to who and what will take Theresa May's place. The section of the Tory party that is most strongly committed to Brexit is out batting for Jacob Rees-Mogg and those who most want to remain in the European Union are most hostile to Jacob Rees-Mogg. That's why he got such a difficult time in the media over the weekend, particularly on the Sunday sofa shows, because as a vastly rich man, he has procured a property of some iconic importance. 
You remember, those of you, Dunsertan Ash, that window with Mrs. Thatcher and big Cecil Parkinson leaning out of it, taking the jubilant celebratory cries of the Tory faithful when Thatcher won one majority after another. Well, that is now a window that's owned by Jacob Rees-Mogg. Yes, he's bought Tory central office, as was in Smith Square, just a stone's throw from Parliament. Indeed, closer to Parliament than 10 Downing Street is itself. Why has he bought that particular property? Well, you don't need to be Einstein to work that out. And despite his protestations that he has no wish to be Prime Minister, you can be sure that if his fellows wish him to be Prime Minister, he will concur. And then there's another set of Tories who have come up with what they call the dream team, but which to me seems something closer to a nightmare team. A team of Michael Gove and Ruth Davidson, who isn't even in the Houses of Parliament, at least not yet. The dog that hasn't barked is that big unruly hound called Boris Johnson. Has he slipped out of the race? And if there's not many people talking about Boris Johnson, there are fewer still talking about Theresa May hanging on. So crisis, crisis everywhere. And we're going to take a drink over it all in the course of the next two and a half and more hours. This is the mother of all talk shows. I'm not wrong, that's the average white man. Pick up the pieces. Many of them from my own hometown of Dundee. Very, very great band. And appropriate because we're talking about what happened at the Portsmouth Mutiny Festival. Now, I'm not, as you will have gathered, a festival goer. I'm not on the festival circuit. Neither have I ever taken drugs. In fact, I literally have never seen a drug. Uh, but I do know the waste of life that was involved at this festival because I am a father of five children. Now, two children died after falling ill at one festival. I don't know what drugs they were taking. I don't know if it would have happened if the drugs had been of a better quality. I'm not sure what it signals about our attitude as a state to drugs, to be in the business of quality control of illegal drugs. But Dr. Henry Fisher is the policy director of Vault Fass, a think tank that explores public policies relating to drugs. And from what I hear, Dr. Fisher has some quite challenging and radical approaches to this problem, and we better hear them. Dr. Henry, thanks very much for joining us. Hi, good morning. Tell us, uh, please, what you know of this tragedy first and how it might have happened. Uh, well, I mean, sadly, what we we don't actually know a lot about what, what's happened yet, and that, that's part of, part of the tragedy, because without knowing more, we can't uh, issue effective warnings to other people who might be considering taking drugs over, over the bank holiday weekend. So we don't know uh, what they actually took yet? Uh, we know that at least one of the people has taken two pills, uh, and I think they've been reported as, as, as uh, being silver with, a, with a, an, an Audi logo on, but that's, uh, that's all we know about them uh, so far. So Some you know, form there might be multiple. Of MDMA, Sorry. some form of ecstasy. One uh, that certainly was my assumption. Yeah, well, that, that's that's part of the problem. You know, everyone assumes whether they're taking them or whether whether they're not. Of course, uh, everyone assumes that it, it it's going to contain MDMA, and that's not necessarily the case. But also, everyone assumes it contains what might be what someone might expect to be, you know, a single dose of MDMA. Whereas, in fact, what what we've seen uh, testing. 
at other festivals, so at, at another festival this weekend, an organisation called The Loop was doing a, was issuing a drug testing service, uh, and they found pills that contained up to what what might be four times an expected dose. And of course, if someone's taking one of those or two of those, then that could potentially be enough to to very easily cause an overdose. Now, why would the manufacturer of such uh, a drug, illegal drug, uh, make it four times more powerful by mistaking the chemistry or uh, because clearly they're cutting their own profit on they could have made four tablets with that? It, it could be an error, but more likely because obviously these drugs are illegal. So there's very, you know, the, the people that sell them have very few avenues for, for marketing or, or kind of show differentiating their products against their rivals. So unfortunately, what that tends to lead to is people progressively making these pills stronger and stronger, and that's that's what we've seen in recent years. Uh, since since uh, 2010, pills have got dramatically more stronger, and of course, people who take them occasionally or that are new to taking them might not realise that actually pills this year, on average, are a lot stronger than pills, say, five or six years ago. And by stronger, we mean more potentially deadly, yeah? Yeah, well, but yes, yeah, more more MDMA uh, in them, and and that means potentially more more deadly. Um, you know, at at a kind of typical expected dose of what might be you know eighty to one hundred milligrams, that's what people look to take. Uh, you know, unless you're very small, um, that's generally not 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 considered very dangerous. But of course, if you're consuming three, four, five times that amount. That's when the danger starts to ramp up, especially if you're consuming it alongside other substances or you're drinking or you're hot and dehydrated and tired. Uh, See, I was puzzled by the report that one of the girls had taken two tablets. And uh, Mm -hmm. if uh, this hypothesis we're exploring now, that could, of course, in theory, mean that uh, she took, if they were MDMA tablets, uh, that she took uh, in two tablets she could have been taking the equivalent of eight ecstasy tablets as well uh, i mean but potentially equally they could have contained a completely different substance which might be far more toxic so it, it, part, part of the, the the problem is it, it, you know it's very tempting to speculate on what it may or may not have been but without more information we don't know and it's it's why finding practical ways to actually provide more information is is really important mm. Help me on this, uh, if nobody else listening. What what do these drugs do? Uh, I mean, so wh- why MDMA, would people take them? What's the upside? So, so at least, so if 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 it's MDMA and ecstasy pill, the intended reason why someone might take it, especially at, at a music festival, is it makes uh, a lot of sensations a lot more enjoyable. It makes the feeling of being sort of in a large crowd more enjoyable. A kind uh, of euphoria. And, and, yeah, euphoria, and, and also it allows people to stay up a lot later. Um, you know, so I, I mean, the reasons why people consume different drugs, they're, they're not hard to understand, um, you know, when you consider there's a lot of enjoyment that people take <laughs> take out of consuming drugs. And a lot of people never experience any significant you know, side effects or negative effects from, from their drug use. The problem is, some people obviously do 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 experience incredibly negative side effects. You know the worst worst extreme of which is, is death. Obviously, help me again on this. How many people do you think take these drugs ordinarily? Let's say in a summer season, lots of festivals, lots of uh, outdoor events. Uh, I mean, we're talking thousands, hundreds of thousands. So I, I can't say specifically on only in festivals, but uh, at least within within festivals. Uh, consumption rates can at, at some festivals be as high as 70, 80 percent. Obviously, at other festivals, maybe more family or family orientated festivals or with different music, it might be much lower. But considering the, the um, consumption in England and Wales, uh, on on average, the annual consumption of MDMA uh, lies to 600,000 people. Wow. So if my kid was going to a festival this summer, um, there's a fair chance uh, that she'd be in an eight, eight out of ten likelihood of uh, of succumbing to the temptation of this. That's quite a frightening stat, isn't it? I mean, I, again, it, it depends on 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 the festival, um, but 
but I mean, it'd be potentially. I mean, it's, it's not something that happens purely at random. Obviously, pe- people tend to, if they go into a festival and they plan on taking drugs, they often plan on, you know, they, they plan that out beforehand. They either and do they buy, buy them, them on before. site, doctor? It, it it's a mix. So some people buy them beforehand. Other people maybe either because they might have been searched on the door and had their drugs confiscated, or because they thought it might be a better idea because they were going to get searched on the gate to buy them inside the festival. Mm. It's not necessarily a, a better idea. In fact, the 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 mis-selling of drugs is much higher when people buy on site at festivals because there, there's no there's no immediate repercussions for the, for the people dealing. They're not going to come across those customers again. And so, finally, this loop idea uh, is basically uh, an amnesty, a quality control. You've bought drugs, bring them along, we'll test them. Is that it? That, that, that's how it works, yeah. So people who come to the festival, they can hand over a small sample of what they've got. So whether that's a, a small scoop of white powder or, or a pill. Uh, we then have a team of trained chemists, which I'm one, um, who... Uh, test test the samples uh, in, in a lab, find out um, what their identity is, what their purity is, what their strength is. And then that information is then fed back to the service users as part of a kind of 15-minute counselling session and brief intervention where the potential harms of their drug use is explained to them and also practical ways that they can reduce the harms uh, are also kind of explained to them. And are the police cool with that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, the police are hugely supportive because you know, the police are a fundamentally a pr- pragmatic institution and they can see that where, where, where the loop are in operation, um, it, it reduces a lot of dr- drug-related harms, uh, uh, you know, a lot, of, um, a lot of the kind of mess that, that, that police have to kind of deal with, you know, if, if someone's consumed too much and they're, and they're in a state and then police need to help carry them to welfare services, something like that. If the loop are there and they're reducing the, the number of harms, then it allows the police to actually target their resources more effectively at, at the more uh, the, the more dangerous crimes that are committed at festivals, or more concerning crimes. So that might be theft or sexual assault or drug dealing. And uh, I said it was the last question. This, I promise you, is uh, do the are the loop morally obliged, legally obliged? to try and counsel against the taking of the drugs? So the, the service we offer is, is, is non-judgmental. We either condone or condemn drug use. The point is to provide practical information. If, for example, uh, a sample is tested, which, which seems particularly uh, problematic or particularly dangerous, then the, you know, the, the, the pragmatic advice to, to counsel is that it's a particularly dangerous sample that we'd advise uh, not taking. Uh, but beyond that, we don't advise either way. Well, you've made me feel very old and very conservative, Dr. Henry Fisher. I'm grateful, I suppose, to you for that. That was Dr. Henry Fischinger, Fisher, Policy Director of Vault Fass, on the approach taken by The Loop to drug taking at festivals and other such events. There's lots, I think, to say about that. But let's get the news headlines with the great Toby Gillis. 0344 499 1000. That's the number to call. You can also, of course, tweet me at George Galloway at Talk Radio. You can email through the website and you can text. Um, begin your text with the word talk and then your message to 8722. Though that'll cost you 25 pence plus standard network rate. I'm still slightly reeling from that last discussion. Um, As regular listeners know, I'm so against uh, the laws of the country being changed, uh, except in Parliament. Uh, That's how I feel about euthanasia, for example, that judges are now taking decisions and doctors are now taking decisions that Parliament has not had the courage to take itself has not been prepared to stand up and be counted one way or the other on that important issue. And what Dr. Fisher just outlined there is effectively the legalisation of drugs without Parliament deciding to do so. Now, you may well take the view uh, that uh, 
that horse has bolted, uh, that the drugs business is so vast and the dangers of hoodlums doing the mixing so great that it would be better if the state became the manufacturer and the quality controller of the drugs. You may take that point of view. I don't. But I can see a logic and a rationale for that uh, standpoint. But what we have now, as described by Dr. Fisher, is neither one of those things nor the other. He, that, the reason I asked him if the police were cool with that, and he said the police were uh, fully behind it. So what you've got is kids, your kids, my kids, potentially, going to a tent at a festival and handing over an illegally purchased illegal drug and a doctor will test it to see if it's even more hallucinogenic, even more intoxicating, even more stupefying than you would normally get if you bought it from a quote-unquote reputable illegal criminal source. So if the police are cool with that, and if doctors like Dr. Henry Fisher are doing that, that means drugs are legal at these festivals. Must mean that. If the police are cool with an amnesty, with bringing the drugs along, having them tested, then that means drugs are effectively legal at these festivals. And to my absolute horror, Dr. Fisher suggested that at some festivals, the proportion of people taking drugs is 70 to 80 percent. That's, would you let your kids go to a festival knowing what you now know if you're listening to this show and listen to that discussion? I wouldn't. I wouldn't have anyway, to be perfectly honest. I'd have tied my oldest child up rather than allow her to go to one of these festivals. And if I'm still around, I'll certainly do everything I can to stop my younger children in due course going to these festivals because of the dangers of what happened to these two kids at the Portsmouth Mutiny Festival. Now, it may very well be that I'm sounding like a dinosaur to you, but I, I recognize that possibility. I had that sinking feeling when I was listening to Dr. Fisher, especially as it's in the same show as a discussion on abortion. But that's where I stand. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to pretend I'm down there with the kids, that I'm down there with the abortion lobby. I'm not. And it would be a lie to suggest that I was. 0344 1000 if you want to take issue with me, or, of course, if you want to agree with me. We're discussing this drug issue. We're discussing the abortion crisis now in the north of Ireland. We're discussing the Italian political crisis, both because Italy is a very important country, but mainly because the core of the crisis in Italy is the EU. And we have one or two issues with them ourselves. Let's talk on that to Ken in Luton. Go ahead, Ken. Morning, George. Morning, sir. They've had trouble since December 2015 when four banks went bust and then they opened up a week later. Now, all them people that put all their savings in shares like they was advised by these banks to do, mm -hmm. now they can't get it back because the simple reason is if there'd have been savings, they might have been all right. But being their shares, then they, they've got to get round Mrs Merkel and she holds all the cards, don't she? Well, that is certainly the view of the Italians. It's also my view that the EU essentially uh, is a ramp for the benefit of the German economy. Yeah, uh, well. And uh, it's worked really well for Germany, but it hasn't worked at all well for many others. And Italy is a prime example where it hasn't worked at all. Well, they've been, you see, they've kept this quiet, George, before the referendum that they didn't want to spread it all about. They buried it in bad news. And when the referendum was taken up, and as you say, th their banks are, are on the brink.
brink. I mean, they've got one bank has got 20 billion non-performing loans. So they're no good. They're like us when we was in a 2008. Yeah. But what I can't understand, it's no one's pointing this out, George. We have people like Alistair Campbell on last night saying he's going to wreck Brexit if he gets the chance. But we ain't got no one standing up for us, George. No, this is... uh, I've identified this, and you and I have agreed on this before. Uh, The real crisis here on the Brexit issue is the utter failure of the pro-Brexit conservatives to rise to uh, the occasion. Uh, They have instead sunk to the occasion. They are uh, a bunch of people uh, from whom you wouldn't buy a second-hand bicycle. And if some of them came down the road canvassing door-to-door, you'd definitely lock up your sons and your daughters. You wouldn't buy anything from them. And nobody has been enthused about Brexit by Liam Fox or by Boris Johnson uh, or by David Davis. These are the pro-Brexit people. Uh, And the anti-Brexit forces have much more money. They've got George Soros' bottomless bag of money at their disposal. They've got ruthless brutes like Campbell uh, and like Tony Blair. They've got the whole of the political establishment virtually entirely. They've got Whitehall. They've got Westminster. They've got the BBC. They've got the Times. They've got the, uh, the bulk of the newspaper circulation in the country. They've got the majority of the Labour Party, majority of the Tories. And who have we got, Ken? We're going to follow Liam Fox. George, because no one's pointing out to all these people that want to remain in there where our jobs have been asset stripped and over gone abroad. No one's pointing this out. They're saying we're going to lose jobs post Brexit. Well, they ought to look before Brexit. Yeah, exactly. Look at the state we're in <laughs> before Brexit. Well, you say no one can, but there's thee and there's me. And I'm grateful uh, to you. Thanks very much for the call, 0344-499-1000. I'm going to be speaking to Professor Matthew Goodwin, who is a senior fellow at Chatham House, the Royal Institute for International Affairs. But he's also Professor of Politics and International Relations at the University of Kent. He's one of the country's top intellectuals, and he happens to be in Italy. And so who else would I turn to? to discuss the Italian political crisis after this. Now, there's something we could have talked about. That Egypt, Roger Daltrey, worth £65 million, demanding that the NHS no longer be free. Maybe we will find time to discuss celebrities that are blithering idiots when it comes to politics. There was another, there's a guy uh, whose name escapes me, quite a good character actor from... uh, from Ray Donovan, uh, put out a tweet this morning that I described as maybe the most stupid tweet I had ever read in my whole life. Uh, What is it about these celebrities? Maybe we'll find time uh, for that. Now, Professor Matthew Goodwin is very, very far from stupid. In fact, he's one of the country's top brains, and he happens to be in Italy. So who better to talk to than he on the crisis Uh, which has enveloped now the political system in Italy. Professor Matthew, thank you very much for joining us. Good morning, George. I'm sorry to disturb your holiday, but the uh, imminent crisis and new elections, perhaps, in Italy is a matter of some import, not just to Italians. Please tell us how. Well, I think what's happening here has big consequences for Europe generally, Uh, Listeners might recall there was an election recently in Italy which saw a strong result for the populist five-star movement, which wants to reform the Italian political system, make it more accountable, more transparent. And on the other side, the hard right 
uh, Lega or, or the League, which wanted to deport half a million refugees and, and was quite xenophobic during the election campaign. Well, those two parties effectively won the election. They then went to form a government and they proposed a very Eurosceptic uh, finance minister who had variously referred to the euro as a German cage uh, and, and advocated that Italy leaves the euro area. Uh, and actually last night, the president of Italy refused to sign off on that new government and specifically on that minister, saying it was too much of a risk for Italy. And so it looks uh, like this morning that two things are going to happen. One is that Italy is going to have a non-elected technocratic uh, uh, new leader, uh, effectively uh, chosen by the president with support from the union and the financial markets. And the second is that Italy is almost certainly headed for fresh elections later in the year. Now, you say the president, but in truth, uh, as we saw in Portugal uh, a year or so ago, it's the EU that's telling these so-called presidents uh, that this or that person, this or that policy is not acceptable to them, isn't it? I think there's a very strong case, George, for making the argument that there are two background influences going on here. One is relating to the uh, EU in, 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 in not wanting uh, Italy effectively to have an openly sort of populist, quite Eurosceptic government, obviously being very anxious after Brexit that, that the continent doesn't have any further, as it sees, instability. But the second factor is the financial markets. Effectively, what happened on Friday is that the credit rating agency said, look, if you uh, go ahead with this government, if you go ahead with this Eurosceptic minister, uh, effectively, we will downgrade uh, the rating of Italy's economy, and that will basically make Italy less competitive in the financial markets. Now, of course, a critic would argue that, that those actors that are manoeuvring in the background are not elected by the people, uh, are certainly not accountable to ordinary citizens. Uh, and I think that is where we will likely see perhaps an even bigger backlash among citizens when those new elections are held later this year. Yes, because it's the same set of forces uh, that led to Brexit, and you could argue led to the election of Donald Trump. You have the establishment, the, the oligarchies, often unelected, uh, unaccountable, deciding uh, what's good for people rather than the people deciding it themselves. And the last time I looked, Italy regarded itself as a democratic country. Well, I think there is a case to be made for why you could run a line through what happened in Greece, for example, partly what happened in Portugal, and what's happened during the financial crisis, you know, where lots of people, including lots of academics, people like Peter Mayer, who have talked about this as the void, the void between the people on the one hand, the, the, the ruled, and the rulers. And that void uh, is increasingly dominated by uh, non-elected international uh, financial uh, institutions. It's rumoured uh, uh, that today, for example, the new leader of Italy will actually be a former uh, executive director of the International Monetary Fund. Uh, whose, nickname, whose nickname is Scissors. Well, indeed. And, the, of course, the sad irony in all of this is that Italy chose this government precisely because it was sick of the austerity and it was sick of the, um, the spending cuts and it was sick of the draconian measures around pensions and so on. And it didn't want to constantly liberalise its economy. And it appears that actually what it's going to end up with is exactly that, a sort of IMF-backed leader wanting to effectively um, uh, and, you know, push ahead with this race to the bottom. Uh, so I, I really, you know, I, I, obviously Europe is very unpredictable. It's very difficult to know exactly where it's going. But I think there's a very strong case to be made in this, in this instance and, and in others in recent years that we do have a fundamental disconnect now between the ordinary citizens on the one hand um, and also uh, you know, the, the European Union uh, and, national, and national leaders um, uh, on the other. And I think, you know, my, 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 my broader point here, George, is that, you know, that, that there is a tension between the fact that we are now in an era with, with international financial markets, but we are still um, practicing democracy at the, the national level. And that tension is, is constantly being exposed. Uh, and it's difficult to know really where, where it's going to end up. Well, it's quite risky and you don't uh, have a crystal ball, but you do have the book. Uh, Italy had uh, a disastrous uh, flirtation with 
fascism with the authoritarian government. Indeed, it was the first fascist uh, state in Europe. Uh, and uh, this kind of high-handedness, I think, brute anti-democratic maneuver uh, can have, well, unpredictable but potentially dangerous consequences, no? I think I think there is certainly a case to be made for why we need to seriously get to we need to seriously explore genuine democratic reform within Europe and that we are at risk of if we're not careful of pushing this populist moment into something that is far more dangerous where you know citizens completely give up on democracy that they feel that it isn't responsive on any level and that they feel that well perhaps actually parties like Marine Le Pen like uh, the Lega in Italy uh, like the Austrian Freedom Party, you know, that they are not uh, uh, capable of delivering the kinds of changes that they promised. And perhaps, you know, in the future, citizens start to flirt with more extreme alternatives. And, and, and the, the weakness here is very much within liberalism itself. And, and, and at least my take on this is I think the mainstream, the liberal mainstream, if you want to call it that, has really got to start asking itself some tough questions about, you know, is it really strengthening the link between people and politicians? Is it really providing the arenas that we need to have lively, uh, democratic, uh, invigorating debates and discussions? Uh, is it uh, su supporting and sustaining the marketplace of ideas, which is the true essence uh, of democracy? And I think, unfortunately, at the moment, uh, growing numbers of, of citizens in Europe are answering no to those questions, and they feel as though their voice is, is either being sidelined uh, or ignored altogether. Well, I'm certainly uh, one of those uh, who would answer that question in the negative. Democracy is one aspect, but um, nationality is another, Matthew, because uh, the people increasingly feel that they want to cling to their national identity, uh, either because they are nationalists, which I'm not, or because they think that at the national level it is possible to take back control uh, because that's of a, a manageable size, whereas the forces at work are supranational in character. The financial markets you've mentioned, the European Union uh, and other institutions, the World Bank, the IMF and so on. Isn't there also a tension between the national and the supranational here? Well, I think I'd have a lot of sympathy for that view. Uh, I think as well, a lot of a lot of my colleagues uh, would as well, that we, we're living in an era where that supranational uh, policy making, the supranational institutions are coming into conflict with the fact that democracy is still primarily being practiced at the national level. Uh, and it is, as you, you know, as you say, it's wrapped up with national identities and in countries like Italy, particularly regional identities. And it's going to be a constant tension. You know, in my, my personal view, a lot of people within the European Union and within uh, Westminster and, and, and Paris and Berlin overestimate the extent to which citizens identify supranational level mm. most people are still primarily national creatures some are regional creatures some are local and we haven't had that transfer you know there is in effect no such thing uh in my view um as the european demos um and we certainly discovered that during the during the brexit um campaign um you know where i think around at maximum about 15 percent of brits felt european in some sense yeah so we are and all of them are on my twitter feed matthew all 15% of them, FBPE. Listen, I'm really grateful to you. That was a fascinating insight from Italy itself by Professor Matthew Goodwin, Senior Fellow at Chatham House, Professor of Politics and International Relations at the University of Kent. Let's get the news headlines with Toby Gillis. <coughs> what is the crisis in London? Well, there are multiple levels of that crisis. The first is that the decision of the people in the Irish Republic by a landslide to liberalise their abortion laws leaves the six counties of the northeast of Ireland that some call Northern Ireland like a beached whale as the only place in either Ireland or Britain that clings to a policy of no abortions. Now, 
that's not going to be able to last. The campaign in Ireland will not stop at the non-existent border. The campaign in Britain has only just begun, and all of it will throw into sharp relief that our government is entirely dependent on 10 bigoted DUP votes. Without them, our government is dead. Not a very strong and stable basis for the governance of a country with multiple economic and social problems and which is now deep into the process of leaving the European Union that we've been in for more than 40 years. This has thrown up three or four issues that I'm going to talk in a minute with Steve Hawkes, the deputy political editor of The Sun, about. First of all, that nobody any longer believes that Theresa May will be the prime minister for much longer. Secondly, who is going to succeed her? There are two camps already more or less out. Jacob Rees-Mogg, who, as I said earlier, has just secured the real estate, iconic, historic real estate in Smith Square, former Tory central office, cheek by jowl with Westminster itself. And that's no accident. Another camp is running what they call a dream ticket, a dream team. Now, when you think of a dream team, you might imagine, I don't know, Hasselhoff and Pamela Anderson. Their dream team is Michael Gove and Ruth Davidson. Boris Johnson appears, speaking of beached whales, not even to be uh, on anyone's agenda. And the least on anyone's agenda is Theresa May continuing herself. It seems to me that that as an option has suddenly, imperceptibly, just died away. Now, Steve Hawkes has got his ear close to the ground at Westminster. Um, we've spoken before, me and Steve, and uh, I'm always grateful for him coming on the show, especially on Bank Holiday Monday. Steve, thanks for this. No problem, George. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Um, and I'm thinking that uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg uh, bought that real estate for a reason. What say you? If he, if I don't think I, I still don't believe Jacob Rees-Mogg thinks he can or or will be prime minister. I, I don't think he's in the running. I think he's a long shot. Um, I, I have no idea. I haven't spoken to him. Yet. I have no idea why he has bought that property. Knowing Jacob, he probably thinks he can make a buck out of it. <laughs> well, he said he was priced out of Mayfair. Uh, heaven for fend. <laughs> a top Tory priced out of Mayfair. What is the world coming to? No, I'll tell you why uh, I think he's more serious than. Uh, you think he is. Um, he is representing now the purest essence of the Brexit uh, elixir. And the membership of the Tory party, with an average age we hear of, of over 70, is, if anything at all, absolutely dedicated to the Brexit uh, project. So if he can paint himself as uh, the member for the 19th century, as a man above uh, normal squabbles, no taint of office about him, and Mr Brexit, that's not a bad five-card trick, Steve. No, of course not, but you have to remember there are two other Brexiteers as such a heading in the running, um, which is Michael Gove, who you already mentioned, and Boris, the beach, the beach whale, as you called him. The, remember these two, you know, Bank vote leave, and they would claim that they are, you know, they, they are, will, they will forever be tainted or whatever or put in with the Brexit camp. So when it comes to it, Michael Michael can quite capably say, look, I voted Brexit, I back vote Brexit, I gave up my friendship with David Cameron to back Brexit, I'm a Brexiteer. But what you've seen recently from Michael Gove is this huge effort to detoxify the Gove, the Gove brand as such. He's become this environmental champion. Yeah, he'll be and hugging he'll, hus him. he'll be hugging a husky that's next. Exactly, that's exactly. But this is hugging. This is his people down here would claim that is Michael's attempt at hugging a husky. So he hasn't actually gone and literally like David Cameron gone and hugged a husky. But he's he's you know he's 
banned straws, he's banned this, he's banned that, and now he's talking about you know re-energising the national parks. He is a, he is a secretary of state who is actually doing something which stands out quite a lot down here at the moment. Yeah, it, it does it's, though, it's Steve. But moment. I'm I'm arguing here that um, being in the government is actually a negative because the government has such bad uh, reputation, is in such a mess that somebody like Jacob, like somebody like Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, who's not tainted by office, actually, that's an advantage. Well, you, you, look, you have an insight into all this stuff. I just I think it's too big an effort for Jacob. I think if you're looking at the runners and riders, like the Grand National as such, I don't think Jacob now... I mean, Jeremy, I know you knew him well, but he came from nowhere, you know, in, in that sense. And I think if you're looking for someone who would be the Tories, Jeremy Corbyn, you'd have to look a, away from you know, one of these candidates that we're seeing on the telly now. Someone who might come from, from nowhere as such, from the back benches, who might charm people and give a message that people hadn't heard before. Jacob, you know, I, I think he, he speaks a lot of sense. He, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of things that Jacob believes in people would be aghast at, um, well, at least his views on abortion, for example. But, you know, he, he is back in that practical. I just think it's too much of a long shot for him. What I think is fascinating at the moment, you saw Boris Johnson writing another editorial for the Daily Telegraph today. The courting of the Telegraph vote is, is incredible at the moment. I mean, Michael had a few stories in the Telegraph recently. Now you see Boris hit back this morning with a with an editorial of his own. That Boris Gove fight will be fascinating. As yeah, it'll forward. be quite brutal. But, Let's um, talk about Gove yeah. for a minute then. Um, yeah. He is, of course, Scottish, though with an English constituency. Uh, he's maybe a little bit odd uh, in terms of his persona. I mean, I, I, I like him, actually. He's a clever guy, very clever guy. Uh, but uh, he's not exactly for the televisual age, would be my first point. And what do you make of this dream team idea with Big Ruth Davidson? Well, I think, I mean, it's, it's a story we broke on Saturday morning. And I think, look, I mean, it's that, but again, that goes to the heart that Michael realizes. I think he realizes he needs a running partner as such who would provide that televisual um, capability as such. I mean, I think Michael would, he reminds, he would remind a lot of people of Ed Miliband with that. A little say, bit, yeah, Ed yeah. Miliband with his bacon sandwich. There would be those moments. There was a picture recently of Michael um, picking up plastic from the beach. And it just, it just looked <laughs> amusing. Did he have a shirt and tie on on the beach? Well, he had a he had a t-shirt over his shirt and tie. <laughs> even worse, where, even uh, worse. Exactly, but I think Ruth. Would, I mean, the key thing in that is one that he realizes he needs a running mate. So you yeah, remember there was Boris before. Now he's he seems to have attached himself to Ruth. But the, another big point with this is that the idea would be, in theory, that Michael steps aside before the 2022 election and lets Ruth come in. Now we all remember what happened before when Boris was stabbed in the back. Can Ruth be sure that she'd be given that chance? Would mm. Michael not think, actually, I like this office, can you wait until 2027, if you know? But she's also anti-Brexit. That's number one. Uh, she's an ex-army officer. She's uh, a pregnant lesbian. Are these not all a bit challenging for the Telegraph readers? No, but we all move with the times, don't we, George? I mean, I think um, if you... But if you Some of us that, do, um, Steve, some of us. <laughs> it takes me an awful long time. No, but if you, if you would marry Michael with, with Ruth, then you've got the two wings of the Tory party, perhaps, and therefore that could be this perfect union. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting development. I think also you have to look at where Andrew Rudd turns up in all this. And would Jacob... I think it comes down to who Jacob would back, that, that wing that Jacob takes with him, who mm. he would back. But crucially, the fact of the matter is that we're talking about this as though... It's as though she's already to gone. Say. Yeah, and, and but you see that in the way that... I, I mean, I, I know I, I took a bit of flat from Downing Street for this, but it's the, but like, for example, over the weekend with the um, Irish abortion vote... She didn't even comment like, on it. No, but you, but you, what you did have was people like Penny Gordon, who's the aid secretary, more or less to calling for the government to back um, a similar move in Northern Ireland. It's not even in her brief, but she was calling for that as though there's no discipline. There's no, there's no, you know, in the days of David Cameron or definitely under Tony Blair, if a minister was to say, oh, I believe this, you know, they'd, they'd be disciplined and say, what are you doing? Why, yeah. why are you saying this? This isn't government line. And uh, what we have now, someone likened Theresa May to a supply teacher over the weekend. Ah, that's a good, you know, good, supply, good uh, supply description. Supply yeah. Comes, yeah, it comes in the classroom, doesn't know where the plugs are and all that sort of thing, and all those students run amok. And it's almost like that now, which which basically lends to that theory that, as you say, that she's, you know, the Prime Minister's in place, she'll run this Brexit thing until next March, next summer, and then we'll see change. But, I mean, next month's going to be key with these votes coming back to the Commons on Brexit. 
it's going to be tricky for the government to get through that. Yeah, sure, it's not a done deal uh, at all. Uh, just before I let you go, and I'm grateful for your time, uh, it's my perception, and I wouldn't have said this at all a year ago, that Boris Johnson too has passed his sell-by date, that, that either someone knew or the people we've been talking about, they're ahead of him in the in the race now. It seems to me that, that Boris Johnson's a pretty damaged brand. Yeah, I think I think he's missed his chance personally. Um, I mean, he's you know, I mean, I think he's one of those people that Labour do really fear. But I mean, I think I think, as you say, I think he's missed his chance. But one I'd like to ask you, George, what do you think Jeremy Corbyn's going to do on the Brexit vote when it comes back? Well, I think he's uh, between a rock and a hard place. You saw a little glimpse of it uh, in the you, clash you know between. Is he going to back the? Is he going to back Stern in this? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm I'm coming to that, but you saw a little <laughs> glimpse of it in the clash between Tom Watson and Alistair Campbell uh, on yeah. the Peston on Sunday. Labour is hoist on this petard. 70% of Labour seats voted for Brexit. Corbyn is undoubtedly uh, sympathetic to Brexit. Historically, I'm not saying which way he voted. I don't know which way he voted. But definitely in his heart, he'd be a Brexiteer. But if he takes a, a, a pro-government, pro-Brexit line, his troops will not follow him. And that's why I think the government may very well lose these upcoming votes, whatever Labour decides to do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that would be that would be incredible, wouldn't it, if Jeremy Corbyn and some of his front bench team vote with the government on it? Um, and I just don't see how he how he how he scores that. I mean, he's got a bigger, he's got a, almost as big a month as Theresa May coming up. He does, but he's not running the country, and she is uh, <laughs> at least for now. And on that, I think we at least agree that she's not long for this political world. Supply teachers never hang around for that very long. Steve Hawkes, Deputy Political Editor of The Sun, thank you very much for joining us. Talk Radio. Digital debate for the UK. Talk Radio. We'll get you talking. The great Otis Redding. I don't know why we played it, but I'm hell of a glad we did. Absolutely wonderful. OK, my phone number is 0344 499 1000. You can text me, you can email me, and you can tweet me, as many people have, at George Galloway at Talk Radio. Uh, here's one uh, from... Well, I'm not sure who. It says, I'm tuned in, and so should you be. Education without the expensive tuition fees. Thank you. Fra says, uh, I have been browbeaten by unionists for decades, claiming a priest-ridden, church-led Irish free state was a medieval backwater. Is the shoe on the other foot now, Arlene? I do think that the uh, changes, the tectonic plates in the north of Ireland just... Uh, began to move a little bit faster this weekend. Scouser Lar says, interesting that the DUP want to be the same as the rest of the UK when it comes to Brexit, but they want to be devolved when it comes to abortion. Uh, Marie says, I predict Italy will have an ugly general election and the EU will be the foremost issue. We should remember the democratically elected Ukrainian government is relevant here. They wanted to drop the euro. This ended in a coup bloodshed and deaths and Damien says uh, well I did eventually go up and vote and believe it or not I was still undecided when I walked into the polling booth but as the women in my life have been so important and influential to me I decided to vote yes and I will just have to live with that and Martin says whatever your views on the sensitive issue of abortion one thing is clear after the Irish vote this weekend and it is this the English Tory party are in total thrall to the DUP. By implication, 10 religious fundamentalists are running the UK. Madness. I agree. And that is a crisis. Bell Nash says, could never understand Galloway's views on Scottish independence, but give me him any day rather than some of the MPs that sold their soul. Well, Bell, um, I just, you know, I'm against the partition of small islands. That's kind of why I've always been against the partition of the small island of Ireland, and by definition, therefore, I could hardly be in favour of partitioning the island on which I myself 
live. And Chris says, Saturday's vote represented a very dark day for humanity, and I do not agree with the way that Northern Ireland is now being bullied into the same. Well, I'm not sure if bullied is the word. There's certainly a slide on, and I don't think it's going to be stopped. Let's hear from the legend that is Damien in Brighton. Go ahead, Damien. Good morning, George. Morning, sir. Um, George, um, I think it would be uh, accurate to say that there are very few certainties in politics. Death Um, and taxes. (laughs) But I think there are some certainties uh, regarding the Brexit question that we can be quite sure of. Yep. Um, I think the first certainty is that um, Theresa May is very much like Hillary Clinton in that she always loses massive poll leads during campaigns. And, And the reason that she does that is because, like Clinton, the more that people hear and see her, the more they dislike her. Yeah. Um, So I think the first certainty is that there is simply no way that Theresa May will lead the Tories into another election. I I think we can say that that's 100%. There's no way she will lead the Tories into the next election unless it was uh, three weeks on Thursday. Um, uh, Jeremy Corbyn destroyed the Tory majority, converted 90 Tory marginals into the seats right for capture next time. Uh, never in a million years will will May be uh, leading the Tories into the next campaign. Now, the other certainty that we know is that, according to a research paper I've read in the House of Commons Library, uh, 65% of constituencies voted leave. Now, I think that that's quite an important statistic because it demonstrates that there's an overwhelming mandate to leave and that that mandate is so overwhelming that no serious power... A party, sorry, that wants to get into power will challenge that. Mandate. Well, look, hold that thought, Damien, because I want to come... Uh, uh, this deserves a longer talk, and I've got to take the news headlines with Toby Gillis. Hang on uh, for me, will you? Toby, over to you, sir. Well, I hope it's not the last time. Not for me, nor for the legend that is Damien in Brighton, whom I had to interrupt to get the news headlines, but was kindly agreed to stay on the line. Damien, uh, let me just uh, recap that stat that you gave us. 65% of parliamentary constituencies voted leave. And am I right in what I said that still more, a still greater percentage than that of Labour-held constituencies voted leave? I'll tell you why I'm accentuating this, because I think this is consistently underestimated in the bubble, where Remain sentiment is overwhelming. Yes, um, that's correct, George. 70% of Labour constituencies voted leave. So I personally don't... I think this um, idea that there's a split in the Labour Party is being, uh, let's say, rather overblown. There's further evidence uh, which would suggest it's being overblown in that, of course... Owen Smith stood as a leadership candidate against Jeremy Corbyn and central to his platform was a second referendum. Um, Owen Smith was roundly defeated. Um, In addition to that, the uh, membership had the opportunity to reopen the Labour Brexit manifesto position at conference and decided against. And, of course, the 13 million voters uh, who voted uh, for the party under Jeremy Corbyn uh, were fully aware, because it was in the Labour Party manifesto, of Labour's position on Brexit. And indeed, of course, Mr Corbyn put on an extra three million votes for that position, the largest vote increase since 1945. Um, so I think there's the fact that 65% of constituents who voted leave, George, leads to two inescapable conclusions. The first is that... Um, no, no major party will call for a second referendum, so that's off the table. And no party will, will each of the major parties will leave the single market. Um, you, we often hear Remainers say, rather insultingly, and I, I think offensively, I voted Remain, but I'm a Democrat and accept the decision, but they rather insultingly say that <laughs> Leave voters didn't understand the question. It seems to me that Remain, Remain voters didn't understand the question. Yeah, I think that's it, yeah. <laughs> If they didn't understand leaving the EU means leave the single market, what on earth did they think it meant? Yeah. Um, 
So just coming on specifically to the Labour question, George, we've obviously got... Um, this also means that the 65% that people like Tony Blair, Neil Kinnock, Alistair Campbell, Peter Mandelson, by arguing we should ignore the result, they are, of course, um, calling for the electoral suicide of the Labour Party. Yeah, most of them don't stand for election, uh, of course, because they're in Parliament for the rest of their lives in an ermine jacket. Exactly. Um, so I think the debate has now moved on, George, and it's not. it's now a question of what type of Brexit are we going to have? Are we going to have a Labour Brexit or are we going to have a Conservative Brexit? And I think um, I don't agree with Boris Johnson or um, Jacob Rees-Mogg on anything, um, but I do think that they are aware of something that Theresa May seems blind to, which is that government's a matter of trust and 17.4 million voters have put their trust in the Conservative Party to deliver Brexit. And I think if they fail to do that, that would certainly represent a, a existential threat to the um, Tory vote. Uh, uh, it would, but let me explore that with you, because you're a Labour man. Um, if the Brexit deal was wrecked by Labour votes in Parliament, we'd then have a general election in which the Conservatives ran as the party that tried to deliver the Brexit that the people voted for, and Labour and Tory rebels wrecked it. That would be a nightmare prospectus for Labour in an election, don't you think? I think it wouldn't be ideal, George, um, and I do personally think that any MP, who Labour MP, who does not follow the Labour line is um, damaging the electability of the Labour Party and enabling the Tories to not only get into power but stay in power for some time because it takes decades sometimes to rebuild trust. But even in that scenario, George, <clears throat> it, my view is this. I would say that if the Conservative Party wanted to act in the interests of the country rather than their own partisan interests, they should go to the country and the Labour offer and the Conservative offer should be... Oh, I agree with that, yeah. And, I agree. And, yeah, and if we look at the offers very, very briefly... Um, the, the blocking point and the paralysis in the Tory negotiations is, of course, they won't accept to guarantee the human rights, consumer, environmental and workers' protections. Labour will. Now, that means that the Tories have resorted to their back position of having the MaxFAC, which will incur £20 billion a year cost to British businesses, um, whereas the Labour Party would have a bespoke customs uh, arrangement with the EU to allow frictionless um, tariff-free trade and would uh, match protections. And I don't think, I think the big issue is that just leaves the question of um, uh, trade with uh, independent trade. And I think that there's movement there because if Labour's effectively saying, look, we will apply and replicate the protections we agree across all of our trade deals, that just leaves the question of um, of tariffs imposed on external countries external to the EU. Now, I think there's movement there because <clears throat> I think that effectively protectionism is, is uh, an indicator of a failed internal market. And it would be actually a good opportunity for the EU to address those issues. Well, if it's still there. Um, last point, Damien. Uh, the one point you didn't mention, but it came into my mind when you talked about decades to rebuild trust. If the Remain camp was as strong as it seems in the bubble, even in this building, even in the talk sport building, uh, then how come Vince Cable has taken the Liberal Democrat vote down from 10%, which was peak Cable, to 7%? They are the explicitly pro-EU second referendum party, and their vote is down at 7%. Exactly, and, and that's a trend now, George, because, of course, in the general election, uh, the Liberal Democrats uh, made a centrepiece of their platform remaining in the EU and refusing to accept the referendum result, and they recorded their uh, lowest vote share since 19, 1959 and lost over 300 deposits. So I'm not at all convinced um, by the claims of the Remainers for this uh, this uh, popular opinion to overturn the result. I don't think it's supported by um, uh, sufficient and strong enough evidence to um, support the strength of their claim. Damien, there's a reason we call you a legend. Damien in Brighton. You see, 
when that was number one, all roads led to London. We were the centre of the world. And we weren't in the EU. Just think about that. The idea that we were living in the caves and painting our faces blue and murdering each other with no human rights, no environmental rights, no labour rights, before we joined the EU in 1973, is one of the greatest deceptions of many, many deceptions that have disfigured this entire EU argument. And you see, the problem is that my side, the Brexit side, is led by troglodytes that can't express what I have just expressed, not least because they were on the other side of most of these arguments. However, Andrew points out on an SMS, Dear George, yes, you're sounding like a dinosaur, and the old saw... The more you resist, the more it persists, applies. Kids will be kids, says Andrew. C'est la vie, says Andrew. C'est la vie in English means that's life. That's life, Andrew, except when you're dead. Except when you took a tablet or two and now you're dead except when your teenage daughter is now dead. C'est la vie, Andrew, except when you're dead. Gadji says, Hi, George, it seems to me that the police have given up on catching the crooks and look to support damage limitation at the sharp end. Sounds desperate to me. Enjoy your day, sir, says Gadji. And Sharon says, this I very much agree with, the EU is a disgusting vessel, full to the brim, with corrupt, controlling liars. They aren't our besties. It's the decent people who are being led a dance. I like Mog and hope he brings May down. Hope he isn't full of wind, too. If Brexit is suppressed, God help them all. People won't take it. Drugs being checked? The kids should be arrested. Police can't be bothered. UK too liberal now. That's from the Queen Vic. 10, uh, Sharon. Now, Sharon, of course I don't support any Tory, but I respect Jacob Rees-Mogg more than the others. I hope Jacob Rees-Mogg is the Tory leader at the next general election. I think a contest between an authentic Conservative and an authentic Labour man in the form of Jeremy Corbyn, would be the dichotomy to dream of. It would be the exact, pure, authentic dichotomy. You could choose one way or you could choose the other. And like you, Sharon, I, and I always say this, but it's amazing how many people tell me how disappointed they are in this or that illiberal part of my philosophy. Never confuse me with a liberal. I'm not a liberal. Not on drugs. Not even on alcohol. I'm not a liberal on euthanasia. I'm not a liberal on abortion. I am not a liberal. I don't believe in a free-for-all society. I believe in government. I believe in the state. I believe in a strong state. So whilst my views and the views of some liberal people can overlap on an issue from time to time. Don't confuse me with you. I am not a liberal. And that means that there are some issues on which I agree with Jacob Rees-Mogg rather than with the liberals. I'm talking small l liberals here. And that's one of the reasons why I said at the time of the Brexit decision that the traditional lines of left and right are beginning to shift. They're beginning to be um, less clear. Couch Tripper says MDMA can be a very useful drug. Alcoholics in Bristol are trialing MDMA therapy. I'll look at that, Couch Tripper. 
because I respect you. Fra says, uh, from Greece to Italy, the EU IMF imposed restrictions, proved that national sovereignty and local democracy is dead. End the EU experiment. I don't believe, Fra, that it's dead. But the attention exists between the two, as Professor Goodwin uh, excellently demonstrated in my interview with him, is palpable and real and obvious and breaking out everywhere on every issue. You see, it's not that I'm a nationalist. Actually, nationalism leaves me cold. Scottish nationalism leaves me cold. British nationalism leaves me colder. It's not that I believe in the nation-state because I'm a nationalist. It's because I am a democrat and a decently sized nation state seems to me the optimal vehicle or machine that can seize back control over our lives in a way that would be beneficial for the mass of the people. A tiny state cannot do so. Let's take Ireland where you are. I'm a hundred percent and all my life have been in favor of the reunification of Ireland. But a small state of Ireland tossed like a cork on the ocean of European Union power will not actually be independent at all. Ditto five million people in Scotland declaring themselves independent and in the EU. That's not independence. They would be entirely dependent. Whereas a state the size of Britain can, could take back control if it was led by the right people, if it was led by people with vision, if it was led by people who knew what could be achieved with the world as our oyster. And Paul says on the SMS, great, insightful show, George. Boris Johnson is the political equivalent of Marmite. That's from Paul Green in Hove. Never liked Marmite myself. Uh, Fra says, if Conor McGinn can bring a private member's bill on same-sex marriage equality for Northern Ireland, surely the same can be done for extending the 1967 Abortion Act to Northern Ireland. Well, of course, if they do that, the Tories will be brought down because the uh, Democratic Unionist Party will not wear it. And that's, I identified this folly. I'm hardly unique in doing so, but unique in that I've got a microphone. I identified this folly right from the minute that this government formed its unholy alliance with the DUP. You cannot have a country of the size and importance of ours ruled by the backwoods men and women of the DUP. Patrick Vedin says, Morning, George. I wish people would start thinking outside of the box. The concept of individual leaders is outdated and flawed. Far more efficient would be a ruling assembly of, say, nine. Let's get away from personality politics and authoritarianism. A national director you have in mind, Patrick. And uh, Terra Vita Nomadic says... Life is a festival. The war on drugs has failed. We all know this. All drugs are dodgy. The list is endless, identifying them. Nothing new here. I don't hear you mention the many junkies who've died in the past 24 hours because there's plenty of them. Well, you see, I'm one of these that doesn't believe there's ever been a war on drugs. I don't believe it for one minute. Are drugs coming in through our ports? How many people's bags are searched at our ports? How many coast guards? How many customs officers have we got? I'll tell you, fewer than we used to have before. We're sacking border guards. We're weakening the border force, not strengthening it. Have you ever had your bag searched? I haven't. Well, I have once, but for entirely political reasons. But I travel in and out of this country all the time. I'm never searched. I could be bringing in bags of drugs every time I come in. People are selling drugs openly on the streets. 
I lived in a street where they were literally outside my door selling drugs. I knew that. The police knew that. Why were they still able to do it? Because we've got too few police, too few police resources, and we've got an actual policy, and Dr. Fisher just confirmed it, in which the police have given up trying to enforce. I'm angry about what Dr. Fisher said, just in case you're in any doubt about that. So if you send your teenage kid to the wrong festival, 70 to 80% of the kids there are going to be taking drugs, and a guy sets up a tent to quality control the drugs that your daughter is going to take, and the police are cool with it? I'm angry about that on two levels. First of all, because I don't believe that constitutes a war on drugs. And secondly, because Parliament never decided to do this. And we can't have the police making the law. We can't have Dr. Fisher making the law. Laws have got to be made in Parliament by members of Parliament that are then held accountable for how they voted on the law in question. Do you get me? Do you feel me? That's why I'm so angry about these kids that are being effectively killed in our hospitals by an effective euthanasia policy that Parliament hasn't voted on. And therefore, the doctor is making the decision. And after the doctor, the judge is making the decision. Well, war is too important to be left to generals. Great moral issues are too important to be left to the police officers at the Mutiny Music Festival or however well-intentioned, Dr. Fisher and The Loop. They don't have the power. They mustn't be given the power to make great national decisions about where we stand as a country on these big issues. That's my view. What's yours? 0344 499 1000. You call us, we'll call you back. It won't cost you hardly anything at all. Now, listen, a lot of people are uh, texting and tweeting uh, about Damien, the legend in Brighton, asking if he's on social media and if they can follow him. So, Damien, if you're listening, as I'm sure you still are, please let us know uh, about that, will you? Because we uh, are agog every time we listen to you. And one or two people have pointed out that you actually, as a Remainer, articulate the Labour policy that should be uh, to leave, you articulate it better than Labour themselves do. And a number of people have said that they hope Jeremy Corbyn is aware of you and that you are given some opportunity to serve. And I certainly uh, agree with that. Now, we have been talking about the crisis that now exists in the north of Ireland and vis-a-vis -vis the British government, dependent as it is on the votes of 10 DUP fundamentalist Christians, because that's all that stands between Theresa May in and out of Downing Street. I said earlier, whatever my own point of view, uh, the wave that was unleashed in the Republic of Ireland uh, over the weekend is not going to stop at a non-existent border in the six counties. And neither will uh, it be tenable for long if it's tenable now uh, that the six counties of one small country can continue to be different, <clears throat> not just from the country in which it sits, but from the state in which it lies, not just lies, but effectively now controls. Kerry Abel is the chair of the Abortion Rights Campaign and joins us now. Kerry, thanks for Hello. coming on board. Hi. Hi. Uh, uh, tell us, uh, first of all, uh, what is the law in the north of Ireland and how that will now differ from the rest of Ireland? Yeah, so because the 1968 um, abortion, 1967 Abortion Act wasn't... Um, 
extended to uh, the north of Ireland. They, they're relying on um, 1861 legislation and um, the Offences Against the Person Act. That's which, modern um, for the DUP, trust me. <laughs> that was when Queen Victoria was on the throne that was passed. and, um, and it, uh, holds Things have never been the same since, Kerry. A life sentence for women who... Um, who uh, try and get an abortion. So I think. So effectively, uh, they have to leave and come to the mainland uh, of Britain, yeah? Yes. And um, a very recent um, uh, piece of legislation that was passed while DUP were in Parliament, but, but sort of, I think, showing in the face of, in the face of their presence um, in the government was um, that now women can come over to, the, to Britain and have their abortions on the NHS for free, but they can't do it in in their own home cities. So I think that this shows, since the repeal um, uh, referendum in Ireland on Friday, I think this shows how totally isolated Northern Ireland now are on abortion legislation and that it isn't safe for women and it isn't fair that it's uh, different it, just because they're in a separate part of, of the state. Well, uh, it's the the early signs are that the DUP and not just them uh, are going to dig in uh, and not. Uh, it's a bit uh, of a canute uh, affair, isn't it? The waves are breaking in front of them, and they're commanding the waves to stop. I think so. I think that people are now saying that this is not what they want. They're not being represented by their government, by their representatives. So. What happens now? Presumably your campaign and the, the, all the campaigners in, in the Irish Republic uh, will move their uh, show uh, north of the non-existent border. <laughs> well, um, we're, I think that women should be able to have access to safe, legal, free abortion wherever they live, regardless of the border. So that's, that's been our position for a long time, and that's, um, that's the call now, and it's become more urgent because... Um, Northern Ireland are looking completely isolated. Yeah, um, but the if the politicians that uh, that uh, govern it in the devolved uh, structure uh, won't move, and if the British government uh, cannot move because it is entirely dependent for its very existence on the forces that control the uh, Parliament, the Assembly in the North of Ireland, uh, you have uh, you you have stalemate, don't you? Well, the British government has been told by the UN that um, it needs to do something about its legislation in Northern Ireland because women don't have access to abortion in, in um, even extreme uh, cases of incest and rape. So they've been told by the UN Human Rights that they have to do something about this. So I think it is incumbent on the British government to um, make sure that women are protected. They are the government at the moment, and it's up to... Up to people, up, is up to them to make sure that women are protected. So am I right in assuming that there will be a big campaign effort? Of course. Any, can you give us a, a taste of what that might be and when it might start? Well, it, it, there's discussions happening now, and so um, it will it will roll out, um, and people will see. We've we've already launched a sort of um, social media campaign, a hashtag now for ni. And I think that's building. I think more more people that join join that sort of rolling effort, um, uh, the the campaign will grow. Uh, the the days when, and this was pointed out by one of our correspondents earlier, the days when the Roman Catholic Church was hegemonic in uh, in Ireland, in the Republic, and amongst the minority population in the North. Uh, are well and truly over for a variety of reasons, some of them self-inflicted. Uh, the the Catholic Church in the North, however, will take the same line as the Protestant churches in the North. You think you can overcome that? I think that this issue transcends sort of that level of um, religious um, politics. I think that this is about what ordinary women need and want for their health care. Um, I think that your point about King Canute uh, is relevant. W women are either coming to um, Britain for their abortions or they're taking abortion pills. This isn't stopping abortion. It's just making it less safe because it's not legal. Uh, and now, uh, as soon as the legislation is through the Doyle, uh, they'll be able to travel to the Irish Republic. 
Yeah, but they're still having to travel. Yeah, no, I'm, of course I'm I'm uh, agreeing with you, uh, mm. but it's uh, it will be particularly poignant for those who mm. define themselves as being not Irish, uh, that in Ireland, as in Britain, uh, there will be one ad- abortion policy, and in six counties, six counties of one of those two countries, there will be the complete absence of those same rights. Yes, yes, it's isolated, especially after, you know, the the dramatic two to one vote in in Ireland. Were you surprised by the margin of the victory? Um, I wasn't as surprised, actually. I think that uh, probably in Ireland, uh, people had um, an idea of what the country was, and that was more conservative than people thought. And so, the only way I think that they could have had abortion legislation was through a popular referenda, and that, and that's what happened. Well, look, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Kerry Abel, chair of the Abortion Rights Campaign, uh, where do you stand uh, on this? Uh, will the DUP be able to play the role of King Canute? Even though Canute's got a bum rap, actually, because what he was actually trying to show were the limits of his powers, not the extent of them. He knew that he couldn't stop the waves, but he's gone down in history as a kind of Luddite who stood on the beach ordering the waves to stop. 0344 499 1000. He's my brother. 0344 499 1000. I've just been watching the pictures of that man scaling five floors with his bare hands, a French building to rescue a little toddler hanging by his fingertips from the balcony of the fifth floor. And the speed with which President Macron uh, brought him into the Elysee and gave him French citizenship. Uh, 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 Definitely a successful day all round. But here was a man who did this because he loved children and he saw this uh, little kid uh, in danger of death and at considerable risk to himself and without negotiating a price for it, he scaled the building and saved the kid. What a fantastic story. It really helps restore your faith in human nature, which from time to time can be tested. Let's hear from Dr. Anthony McCarthy, in London uh, on the Irish and the abortion issues. Dr. McCarthy, welcome to the show. Go ahead. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, well, uh, just to say, i just come back from Ireland and uh, uh, the vote has been a big shock, as probably people can uh, hear. Um, the yes side certainly got a lot more than the no side ever expected. Two to one it was, uh, yeah? Two to one, uh, which is almost an exact reversal of the 83 referendum, which was two to one the other way, yeah. which was to put the constitutional amendment in. The straw was in the wind with the uh, same-sex marriage uh, referendum, don't you think? I mean, the, the Ireland is uh, a much more liberal place than it was before. I think, it's, I think it's become that way. I thought that the abortion issue would be uh, somewhat different um, because basically because of the nature of abortion it's a much harder sell let's say um people who have one view about gay marriage <clears throat> very many will have a different view about whether it's okay to kill the unborn so i thought that abortion might be more different but i think you know there's a general um attitude uh, afoot a sort of much more consumerist culture has has led to this um and I think it's actually very sad because Ireland had very good maternal health care. Um, they had a proud record. Um, you know, I think uh, um, they've been told that they have to have this. And, and the irony is that they, they've ended up going down the path of, of England, um, which has seen 9 million abortions since '67, And they've voted through legislation, which in fact will be very, very liberal. No, uh I agree with you uh, in general, as you know, uh, but the uh, political facts on the ground now are uh, that uh, the six counties in the north of Ireland uh, are really standing now in stark 
contrast to both the island of which they're a part and the state uh, that they, uh, the majority, uh, slim majority nowadays, I think, uh, intend to cling to. That's bound to have significant political impact, isn't it? Well, there's, there's always been quite a bit of pressure from the abortion industry on Northern Ireland. Um, that's been an ongoing thing, and, and sure, it's it's going to get uh, harder, but I think the facts on the ground are that, that fewer women in Northern Ireland were going for abortions. It was dropping. Um, Mary Stopes tried to open a clinic in Belfast, and it failed. Um, you know, Northern Ireland, I think, has a, has, a, has a proud record on this, and, you know, they might understandably say, look, you know, we're a religious people. This is a matter of life and death. You know, we shouldn't be pushed around by um, you know other governments. Well, they, are they, they religious people? Uh, the you would have said that the Irish Republic was uh, a religious people, uh, but the facts are it is no longer. And in the north, uh, I'm willing to bet you that uh, a considerable majority, the same kind of majority of Roman Catholics in the in the six counties would vote the same way as their co-religionists did in the Republic. And it remains to be seen whether the so-called loyalist parties uh, are commanding whatever vote they have on a religious basis or on a sectarian one. Well, of course, these things are always um, complicated, but certainly the uh, Ulster Unionists are now the most outspoken on the issue of abortion in, in Northern Ireland. But interestingly, the pro-life groups in Northern Ireland are almost entirely Catholic. So the people on the ground tend to be um, sort of vocal Catholics. But when it comes to political representatives, the uh, Protestants tend to be the more outspoken in the, in, uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, MPs. Uh, yeah, it, it is it is difficult to to say. I mean, what I would do if I were in Northern Ireland, I would I would defend the record in Northern Ireland. You know, you don't have a maternal mortality health rate worse than England. You have um, an awful lot of people that have been born that otherwise wouldn't be by um, keeping this law in place, you know. Um, and that's something I think any, any country can be proud of. Um, and when a country decides to chunk that in, they might look back 50 years down the line and millions of people fewer and say, well, maybe that's not... Uh, Maybe that's not the way we should have gone. Maybe that's not what healthcare is about. Um, you know, I think it's a it's a sad state of affairs if, on this issue, we have to look to Northern Ireland. Um, well, you know, there uh, are many bad things about Northern Ireland, but this isn't one of them. I'm not sure you'll get many people uh, queuing up to support the DUP uh, in in the north of Ireland. Doctor, thank you very much for your call. Let's take Chris in Luton. Go ahead, Chris. Hi, George. Hi. Um, I understand, but I disagree with your view on on drugs and, uh, you know, suggesting that if we had more, you know, policemen and and border control, that we we would reduce it. Um, I worked in the treatment field for 25 years, um, and there wasn't much I didn't see, you know, some pretty horrible stuff. Um, People overdosing, people losing their children. And what I learned was that absolutely no one doesn't take drugs because of the law. Um, you know, and obviously there's different types of drug use, there's problematic drug use um, and alcohol use, and then there's these kids, you know, doing drugs recreationally because obviously they, they have a good fun and, and, and enjoy it and so forth. Um, I Until mean, they're the dead, not, Chris. Sorry. Well, the, the thing is, George, what they do know, obviously, is that millions of people are taking drugs. I mean, I run a pub now, and I've got an ongoing battle with cocaine users, um, you know, and, and, and the thing is, is the reality is, is that most people don't die. Um, they, they, they use drugs recreationally. Some have got problems. Some won't admit they've got a problem and so forth. Well, look, I, um, let me... Uh, that's very interesting, Chris, and I'll let you back in, of course. I'm interested in your perspective. Um, but I, I was watching, what is it called now, with my wife the other night, Patrick Melrose, upper-class yeah. drug using. And I've just finished Irvin Welsh's brilliant new uh, novel, uh, although the themes are uh, similar to previous work, uh, called Dead Men's Trousers. And I was just saying to my own family the other day, how can anyone read these things and how can anyone watch these things and still think it's a good idea to take drugs? The Even if you don't die, the anti-social, anti-family, 
anti-health consequences of addiction to drugs that you are struggling with in your boozer, uh, cocaine, uh, are so dramatic, so destructive, that there ought to be a national consensus that taking these drugs is not a good thing. And if our national conclusion is that taking these drugs is not a good thing, then the only issues that remain are how best can we stop people doing it, surely? Well, um, I'm, I'm not saying it's a good thing. And, we, we, you know, the reality is, George, is that there's always been massive shock horror stories about drugs, particularly in, in the, you know, uh, the media, hugely um, hypocrisy, because we know that the media has been, you know, cocaine fueled for, for many years. Not, all, not everyone, again, but you must know, you know, yourself, that it's been pretty rife. Um, and also I don't, break- let me say for the record, I don't, uh, and I mean that sincerely. Okay. I, I, I've actually never seen a drug or seen anybody taking drugs. And, well, and I mean, I've worked in the media uh, all my life. Uh, yeah, but I, I do think, no, you have to break it down, George. I mean, the reality is you can't tell a young person who goes to a rave, who takes some ecstasy, who has this most amazing time, and, you know, I mean, a lot of people, they, they do it and they stop doing it, George. But I think by criminalising it, we're just driving a wedge. I mean, it's a pub. It is, I agree with you. It's a massive public health concern. But, you know, what, what, when you look at heroin users, I mean, by and large, they are self-medicating because of, like, abuse issues from childhood and so forth. I mean, you know, they're a very, very different category from people that, you know, smoke weed and, and, and do coke. And I, I just... Where I do agree with you, though, George, is, is the fact that the police seem to be, you know, choosing um, or, or, or deciding on drug policy because the, the politicians haven't got the backbone to, to face it either way. Yeah, that, that, that that's a bigger tricky. problem for our democracy. And, and drugs is not the only issue, as I said earlier, in which this is happening. It's cowardice amongst the political class to be yeah. counted one way or the other on this uh, big debate. And leaving Can it to the police drugs? and yeah. to the organisers of uh, of festivals to decide drug Can policy. Can I just say one more thing, George? Of course, mate. Treatment services, because um, I mean, in Luton, we used to have a fantastic network of, of treatment services. Um, we work with the police, we work with pharmacists, we work with social services. The Tories have basically privatised the whole thing. They brought in companies which are payment by results with, with the drug users. Now, I believe that a lot of crime. Um, is um, attributable to what's going on, and people seem to be just turning a blind eye to it. I mean, the streets of Luton now are like the Wild West game with people who, are, you know, they, they're challenging people, and you're not going to get them off drugs. But what you do is you protect the community, community safety, public health. Um, well, I mean, I don't agree with encouraging people to do it, George, but I just think that. You know, I mean, I just wanted to make the point about treatment services. Yeah, no, it's a good point. Of course, I'm familiar with the debate, and I'm also familiar with the fact that many people who otherwise agree with me don't agree with me on this, but I can't pretend to have a different view uh, just because of that. Uh, And you indicate there one of the issues. It isn't just that drugs are harmful to the person taking them. Uh, they, They lead to... Uh, in some cases, uncontrollable levels of criminality in order to pay for the drugs that are being taken. Uh, People are stealing from their own mothers, uh, cheating their own friends, ripping off uh, anybody that moves in order to buy these things. So it's crime as well as health, isn't it? I mean, the thing is, I mean, we used to see people come in who are injecting in their groin and God knows what, and within a matter of, you know, weeks, they'd stopped injecting. The amount of heroin they were using had gone down by 90%. Um, But sadly, the prognosis is is extremely poor in terms of time. You know, no one gets off heroin in a hurry, whatever they may tell you, Um, and it's not a recreational drug. But, again, jumping around, I think that from, you know, I mean, you, you talk about border p- control. I mean, most of the weed in this country is now grown in this country. Um, and the police have said, well, we haven't got enough resources to deal with well, that. Well, they're know, right so. about that. But that's an argument for more police resources, not just letting it all hang out. Well, I, I, I think it should be regulated at a very minimum. You know, I mean, the problem is, is what you've got here is all the people that are growing it, are growing the strongest sort of skunk weed. I mean, if you go to Holland, people aren't smoking that. They might be smoking something a lot less powerful, 
um, and they, they they respect it more. Over here, we've got the worst of both worlds. We've got you know, higher levels of substance misuse, and we've got a, a government who's just completely and utterly just given up on, on their responsibility in terms of public health. I mean, it, it's just shocking. and um, Shocking you know, indeed, Chris. Thanks for that. I wish we had more time to talk, Chris, in Luton. But I've got to take the news headlines with Toby Gillis. I thought we weren't allowed to play that anymore, that song. I thought it was uh, too politically incorrect. Fra says, I'm at the beach listening to Galloway. It doesn't get much better. Great weather, great show. Come on, George. You see how people's listening, the methods of their listening has changed. You see, I see this as a kind of fireside chat uh, with me as uh, Franklin Roosevelt and families gathered round an old wireless. And there's Fra listening on the beach. Fantastic. Thanks, Fra. Stephen in Welling Garden City. Go ahead, Stephen. Hi again, George. Hi. I know you like the sound of my town. I, I, I so love saying the words Welling Garden City. I've never yeah. been there, but and, and I'd be disappointed, I'm sure. But I love yeah. I love the name. You'd love it. So, yeah, come up one day. All right, man. Right. Well, I basically agree with you on the issue of abortion, but I also agree it's the will of the people of the different parts of these islands. But the bit I think I took exception to was when Kerry spoke to you earlier, she said the UN had told, told Britain that it should look into this matter. And it was the fact that she said the UN told us. It sounded rather like the EU issuing a directive, you know, mm. telling us. And I thought, well, look, the UN has said lots of things over the years. It's told Israel to pull back to its pre-1967 borders. It, you know, the UN has said many things to many countries. Exactly. And said, sure, yeah, move on. Yeah. It has, I mean, has uh, less power than a parish council. Yes, and she made it sound as if, oh, we've got to jump now and listen. Because I think she was young and, and naive about the importance of the UN, that was all. Yeah, probably you're right. I mean, because if that had come from the EU, I think you would agree with me that we'd take exception to it because we'd say, well, no, it's not an EU matter to decide for us what we do, whether it's euthanasia, whether it's abortion. It's yeah. for the people. No, I agree. I, I entirely uh, agree with that. The problem for the six counties now is that the British state and the Irish state have both got abortion policies, which six counties of one of those countries and one of those states are saying uh, this uh, doesn't apply to us. That's not tenable, Stephen. That will not last. No. Are, are there any countries in, in Europe, as far as you know, George, that have strict abortion laws still? I, I, mean, I, d I don't actually know, but I'd be very doubtful if they did because the former socialist countries had extremely liberal uh, abortion policies uh, and most of the capitalist countries long ago gave up on religion. Uh, true enough, yeah. And I suppose the Middle East would be anti-abortion, wouldn't it, in general? I mean, Yeah, George... Muslims believe that uh, abortion is uh, acceptable up to the 100th day. Uh, Muslims believe that God breathes the soul into the unborn child at the hundredth day, so that's effectively three months. So, in in uh, in the Muslim idea, uh, I don't know about the laws in individual countries, Muslim countries, but uh, up to three months, uh, it would be religiously uh, acceptable. Uh, and after three months, in any circumstances, it would not be, because then for Muslims, you'd be killing an actual human soul. True, true enough. And I'm sure they wouldn't listen to, to the UN dictating to them what, what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. Definitely not. Stephen, a pleasure to talk to you again. And Chris is in Colchester. Let's hear from him. Go ahead, Chris. Hi, George. Hi. Yeah, uh, I just think, uh, I hope people are waking up to the fact that we don't really live in real democracies. Um, because if you vote the wrong way... It just isn't tolerated. Yeah, um, I've seen that here. With well, that happened. Britain. It happened in France. It happened in Ireland with the uh, with the the Lisbon Treaty, Lisbon Treaty. 
Uh, it happened in Greece, where they elected an anti-austerity government. Then the EU and its central bank broke them on the wheel. It happened in Portugal, where a left government was elected, and the EU told the president that certain ministers were simply not acceptable, certain policies of the ruling majority were not acceptable, and now it's happened in Italy. Yeah, and it, and it happened in Gaza when they voted the wrong way in 2006, and they're still being punished for it. Indeed. Um, so, yeah, that, I just think and America's been punishing people for in South America when they vote the wrong way uh, for, for decades as well. Um, but... Um, I, would, I, would I think like it's not see... so much, Chris, that we don't live in democracies. We live in uh, countries where there's a tension between democracy, uh, the nation state and the supranational forces that actually govern us. And that tension, that, that contradiction is played out in all kinds of ways uh, in different countries all the time. So it's not that we give up on democracy, I think. It's that we insist on it. And uh, yeah. when, when democracy comes up against supranational economic uh, power, uh, we say the peop our people are supreme. Yeah. I mean, I'd, and regarding Brexit, if, if we're going to make that happen, I would, like to, I would rather see uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg than Theresa May because I've said to N Nigel Farage the other day, I can't understand why she's prime minister. In the real world, if you do a horrific job, you don't get promoted. You get sacked. Yeah. And uh, she was a hor horrendous... She is the most unlikely country. of all figures ever to have governed our country, certainly since Alec Douglas Hume uh, in, in when Macmillan had to retire in 1963. Uh, it, she's utterly implausible, completely implausible, even to Tories, even to Tory newspapermen. I spoke to... Uh, the young man, uh, Stephen Hawkes, from The Sun earlier, even to right-wing Tory newspapers, she's utterly implausible. Yeah, she's a disaster, and um, I just I just worry. We're, we're, I feel like there's a storm coming um, if Brexit is going to be um, derailed. And um, I agree. Uh, I've said it. Uh, it's a big thing to say. But I think that social peace in this country will be threatened if the political class betray the decision on Brexit. Yeah, so, you know, I think, um, like I said, I, Jacob Rees-Mogg, there was a great example the other day where he sort of lectured Jeremy Corbyn about the Constitution, and then Corbyn, rather than sort of coming out with some gibberish, he said, well, he's right. So it was kind of thought, well, it was quite refreshing to see them two as the heads because they believe what they say. And yeah, exactly, and I, I think that's what democracy should be. It should be uh, not a false dichotomy, but an actual dichotomy, and the dichotomy that uh, in the country we live in now is between Jacob's uh, quintessential conservatism and Corbyn's quintessential Labourism. That's what the choice should be, isn't it? Yeah, I hope so. I mean, if, if they get rid of Corbyn and then have some Blairite figure ahead versus Theresa May, what's the point of voting? There's just no exactly. difference. Two cheeks of the same backside. Yep. Chris Definitely. in Colchester, many, many thanks uh, for that. I better read some of the traffic, which is uh, uh, really building up here now. Uh, this from Asif. Every morning I walk 30 minutes to work in deepest Tory suburban Surrey. Every morning, without fail, there are people openly smoking weed. Rightly or wrongly, the police are not bothered about marijuana. Fantastic show. Asif. Thank you, Asif. And Terra Vita Nomadic says, Interesting point of view. The war on drugs has failed, even if it is fake. And Archie says, George, drugs are either made in the kitchen or bought online. What chance do police or customs have? Well, I don't understand that point, Archie. They're either coming in from abroad, which I imagined much of them are, or they're being illegally produced in our own country. If it's the former, then we need a proper border force uh, instead of a denuded one to combat the trafficking of illegal drugs and weapons, by the way, that are coming across our borders. Or if it's the latter, we need a proper police force uh, with enough numbers and enough resources to combat it. You can't say, you know, uh, burglary. Uh, what we're going to do, legalise burglary 
because it happens all the time and the police don't have enough people to stop it, where are you going to stop with that? All kinds of crimes carry on, irrespective of the law, but that's not a reason for legalizing them. It's not a reason for stopping uh, trying to catch the practitioners uh, of it. Patrick says, on religious grounds, I agree with George's position on abortion. Society should discourage the killing of unborn children unless special circumstances. However, it should be a decision of the prospective mother and suitable facilities should be provided. And Chris says, what's happening to the morality of this country now? Abortion, drugs, war, etc., all seemingly being promoted by the majority of liberal media now 24-7. And Scouser Lar says, and many, many people agree with him on this, Damien from Brighton would make a fantastic Labour MP. Jeremy Corbyn needs people like him. And you, of course, George, instead of the self-obsessed fifth-column Blairites currently stinking out the PLP. And Tony from Stirling says... Abortion should be made legal. There are too many dangers to keep it as a crime. However, if people demand that women should have a voice and a choice on abortion, then we do also have to recognise that an unborn child has neither. Now, I wanted to talk, if we've got time, uh, about the W.H. Smith. In fact, the high street as a whole. Let me do that. Right after this. No particular place to Well, that'll be me uh, right after this uh, show, riding along in my automobile, my baby beside me at the wheel. But I'll not be stealing kisses because the car will be full of my already existing babies. Uh, but you get the point. I've uh, actually enjoyed it today more than I expected to. I'm standing in for my friend Mike Graham uh, all of this week between 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. It's a new slot for me, a new... Uh, a new vibe, if you like, and if you enjoyed it, tell others and join me again tomorrow. Now, the show's not over, and when it is, Steph and Dom are up next, and I'm getting the chance to hand over the reins to them. So stay tuned for that. Now, it's been a very bad day for W.H. Smith. Indeed, it's been quite a bad few weeks. Uh, when I read that W.H. Smith, which has effectively a monopoly position inside many hospitals, was charging £7.99 for a tube of toothpaste, exploiting the vulnerability of the patients in the hospital. £7.99 for a tube of toothpaste. Any residual affection that I had for the store died. Not that I had much because I have watched, because I'm old enough, W.H. Smith go from being actually rather a posh shop, uh, a kind of hushed shop that you went into to buy high-quality stationery and so on, into what I think is now effectively a jumble sale, a vulgar, jumped-up jumble sale. And so when I saw the witch, uh, the research, the witch uh, exercise this morning where they had a survey asking people uh, who were bottom of their list, it didn't surprise me that W.H. Smith came as the worst high street retailer. And of course, they're not the only ones in trouble. Marks and Spencer have just uh, indicated uh, that they are going to close uh, hundreds of stores by 2022. So I wanted to squeeze in, and I apologize to her for the lack of time, Kate Hardcastle, who's a retail expert just for a quick tour of the High Street Horizon. Kate, thanks for joining us. Oh, no problem at all. Good bank holiday Monday to you. And to you. Now, tell me, were you shocked, surprised at WH Smith coming so poorly in this survey? Unfortunately not. I think what's fair to say is WH Smith have stated this morning that they feel this survey isn't particularly balanced because it's only of 187 interviewed customers. And they don't think that's a wide enough base to take this judgment on. Well, but here's 188. I, I'm the 188th. It is actually gonna... dreadful. 
Abs- I was going to say, actually, I take the temperature of the high street every single week. And that's right from the top of the country to the bottom and also internationally as well. And I think what WH Smith are confusing it are sometimes that people need to shop there because, as you've mentioned, it is the only store in a hospital or a train station or a, a, an airport. And therefore, it's out of lack of choice rather than out of any brand loyalty or feel good factor for a brand that seems to have completely lost its way and seems to actually only really reap those profits in from taking advantage of the customer. And we all know, as customers, we're so savvy now, it can only have that opportunity for so long before there will be complete rebellion. Yes, uh, maybe even by the shareholders. Who owns it, Kate? It's part of the people. Oh, what a pity. We've lost Kate. I knew it was a bad line. Uh, And so I'll just talk until uh, Steph and Dom come in uh, because we'll return to this. Because I wanted to ask her about Marks & Spencer, which, contrary to W.H. Smith, is actually still a class act as a retailer. And some of the Marks & Spencer stores, like the one in Westfield, for example, and many others, are really top-class stores where if, you are, if you've got a few bob, you go to buy better-class food. Uh, it, the quality of its clothes, though maybe not the range, uh, are good and good value. And it's had some of the top entrepreneurs in the country running it, and yet nobody seems to be able to arrest the flow away from Marks and Spencer and the closure of, I think it's 200 uh, Marks and Spencer stores by 2022 is very, sorry, it's 100 plus, uh, is very bad news for those who shop in them and bad news for the workers who uh, earn their living uh, from them. So maybe we'll uh, return to that at uh, more length. I'm sorry if I didn't get to your call. I'm sorry if I didn't get to the hundreds who've written in on SMS, on email, and on the the Twitter. Uh, But we will, of course, uh, be back tomorrow, so there's plenty of other opportunities. Now, my good friends, the very not W.H. Smith, the the (laughs) even, I would say, upper class, Steph and Dom are up next. They're the kind of Bollinger of the radio business rather than the cheap sherry would you say Dom? <laughs> that's very kind george thank you very much i'll take that what have you got <clears throat> for us today well we've got a variety of bits and pieces um are you currently sitting in your garden with your face squashed up against someone else's fence no i have a nice garden uh, yeah. that i work hard to maintain uh, my wife uh, standing over me supervising mm-hmm. uh, no we have a nice garden and i'll be sitting in it later well, we're going to be touching on a little bit of um, neighbourly disputes. What else have we got, Danny? Neighbourly disputes. Absolutely. Mm. Good yeah. morning, everybody. Good, Good morning, morning, sir. Good afternoon, Good even. Good afternoon. Perhaps. I'm so used to doing the morning. I'm sorry. This is, this is this is quite a treat. Well, it's morning because we haven't had lunch yet. Yeah, that's Indeed. it. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Um, so, yes, we're going to learn uh, how to be a town crier, if ever you fancied the idea. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. You get a red coat, you get a bell. You do, yeah. but there, there are there are hoops you have to jump through. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. You, you've got imagine... to pass exams to be a town crier? Kind of. You need a loud voice. Well, I've got that. Yeah, yeah I think you could do it. I could, yeah, three-cornered hat. I could see I you mean, in a feathered uh, hat. It's good to have a trade to fall back on. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Just in case we ever get the sack from here. <laughs> yeah, true. Which is more than likely. Um, and uh, what else are we going to do? We're going to be talking about hippos and flowers. Uh, we're also going to be uh, talking about a particular TV show coming up next month, next week. I can't really remember. Um, I haven't seen it before. We're going to talk about it. And also uh, budgie smugglers. Mm. Budgie smugglers? Yes. What? Underpants? Yes. Yeah. My goodness. I hope you got them from Marks and Spencer. Look, I've got to go before this turns. <laughs> Inevitably wrong, yes. <laughs> I don't want to say what I was going to say. It's been marvellous for me. Stay tuned to the wonderful Steph and Dom, only on Talk Radio.